staying in your seats uh, as this talk changed at the very last minute. Uh, this is going to be about the Great Lock Debacle of 1851, a phenomenal period of public exploration of physical security, um, exploit research that was done in public forums, in the newspapers, things like that. A really remarkable period of time. We're going to hit some of the high notes of it. I mean, you're also going to hear a lot about yachts and reaping machines, um, but I promise it all relates. So. My slides won't advance. There we go. I am Skylar Town. I'm a professional lock picker. Um, I had the pleasure of running a very successful Kickstarter. I was attempting to raise $6,000 from the public to launch my own line of lock picks. I ended up raising $87,000. Um, and as a result, I have been able to quit my old job as a graphic designer and now pick locks and research and come to things like this full time. I'm the founder of NDE Magazine, that's Non-Destructive Entry Magazine. We had about a year of fantastic content three years ago, and it will come back someday. Um, and Open Locksport, Open Locksport is the lock picking company. Um, I won't go into too much more detail about that. The short version is we finally have a ship date for the picks, first week of July. I'm also very easy to track down. You can find me at SkylarTown.com, um, where I'm trying to actually make use of the blog a little more to talk about some of the history and some of my competitive experience as well. And at Shoebox on Twitter is one of the easiest ways to get in touch with me. Uh, I'm also a former Wheel of Fortune contestant. Uh, <laughs> as a matter of fact, Pat Sajak is one of the only people in the world, one of, I think, I think we only made like 50, maybe 100 uh, physical copies. One of the only people in the world who has a physical copy of, non of non destructive entry magazine. Um, and I'm obsessed with locks. Uh, case in point, I installed a mini mill in my bedroom. Uh, specifically so that I can make cutaways of locks and work on different tools and things like that. Uh, two quick recommendations if you're ever installing a mini mill in your own bedroom. Number one, it's not great for a relationship. Uh, I wasn't in one initially, I am in one now and it's, I mean there's brass shavings everywhere. It's horrible, like brass shavings get into bed with me and it's terrible. Um, uh, additionally, don't put it right next to your home office. Again, brass shavings everywhere in my computers. It was a horrible scene. I had to install a blast shield, et cetera, et cetera. Mini mill in the bedroom, I wouldn't recommend it, but it's really nice to wake up, be a little groggy and be like, oh man, I'm gonna cut some brass today. Okay. <laughs> Um, it allows me to make beautiful cutaways of locks. These are just a couple of simple pin tumbler locks. I've done a lot of other stuff, but, and I, I've said this before, I've said that the smell of brass and grease is invigorating to me, um, and I was joking about it when I first started saying it, but man, as that brass gets cut on the mill, it's just, it's, yeah. <laughs> Shut up, datagram. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, today we're going to talk about history, and just to give you a quick idea of how I got interested in the history of locks myself, um, when I first started picking, I put out a call on Craigslist, actually, just saying, I will take your locks if you don't want them anymore. And an old locksmith actually gave me milk crates full of locks in like a, uh, it was really sketchy. We had to meet on like the second level of a Costco parking garage. Um, and he would like from his trunk into my trunk, but he was great. And one of them happened to say Yale and Town Manufacturing Company. My last name is Town. <clears throat> so I called up my dad and said, hey, have you ever heard of Henry Robinson Town, who is this gentleman in his beau chapeau? Um, and he asked me a couple of questions like what time period, where did he live, where was he doing work, um, primarily Pennsylvania, a little New York, some New England stuff. Um, and I'm, I think, like 13th generation just in Vermont where I grew up. We're like an old farming family. And my father basically said, yeah, he's one of ours. It's, you know, a branch, but he's definitely one of ours, which was really interesting. So I started learning a lot more about Henry Robinson Town and his fathers and so on and so forth, and a lot more about Linus Yale Jr., the person that he was in business with. Now, when I first found out about them, um, I didn't quite understand the timeline, and I thought that they were in business together for a long time and developed all sorts of interesting things. They knew each other for like three months, and then Linus Hill Jr. died. Um, he died Christmas Day, 1868, uh, and they had only established the business, um, I think, late summer, early fall of 1868. <clears throat> so, a lot of the things that 
I find most interesting about the lock development actually came as a result of my uh, ancestor who didn't always make the best decisions. Uh, pin tumbler locks would not be the prevailing locks in America were it not for the fact that this guy died. Um, despite him being the progenitor of the modern pin tumbler lock, he genuinely believed that any lock that took a key could not be perfectly secure um, and had begun work on many other things when he passed away. And then Henry Robinson Tail, uh, Town, savvy businessman, said, aha, pin tumbler locks for everyone. Um, and then that's what we had for the next 150 years. Okay, so. Uh, a lot of what I'm going to talk about today has to do with this man, Alfred Charles Hobbes, um, of whom beard I am jealous. Uh, he was a lock designer, a lock picker, would go on to do all sorts of other things. Um, I'm going to talk quite a bit about him and his history. But first, I want to set the stage for the period of time. Uh, that I'm talking about in general. Everything was going on at the Great Exhibition of 1851. This is the Crystal Palace, which at the time um, was one of the most remarkable architectural achievements ever carried out. It was kind of a modern wonder of the world at the time. Um, all glass and enormous, and it kept around for a very long time. Uh, I found records about a, decade, about a decade later of an English club team, uh, soccer, who were FC Crystal Palace. It was made up of the groundskeepers of the Crystal Palace uh, a decade after the exhibition had happened. So they kept it around for an incredibly long time. Um, and I don't, I mean, my friends and I often joke that foreign countries might not even exist. We get on a plane and we get off and everybody's talking funny. I've never been to England. It's probably still there. I know nothing about that. My actual knowledge on the subject is incredibly narrow. So I'm going to talk about agricultural implements and yachts. I know nothing about any of them. I'm just here to tell you some stories. So, um, when the exhibition first kicked off, the, <laughs> um, the papers ripped us apart. Quick quote. This is from the Times of London. If the Americans do excite a smile, it is by their pretensions. Whenever they do come out of their province of rugged utility and enter into competition with European elegance, they do certainly make themselves ridiculous. Their furniture is grotesque, their carriages and harness are gingerbread, their carpets are tawdry, their patchwork quilts surpass even the invariable ugliness of this fabric. Their cut glass is clumsy, their piano sounds sound of nothing but iron and wood. Their bookbinding is that of a journeyman working on his own account in an English market town. Their daguerreotypes are the sternest and gloomiest of all daguerreotypes. <laughs> their printed calicos are such as our housemaids would not think it respectable to wear. Even their ingenuity, great as it is, becomes ridiculous when it attempts competition with Europe. Double pianos, a combination of a piano and a violin, a chair with a cigar case in its back, and other mongrel constructions belong to a people that would be centaurs and mermen if they could, and are always rebelling against the trammels of unity. <laughs> to which I say, yeah! <laughs> I would be a centaur in a heartbeat if I could. <laughs> um, so we really were ripped apart in the, in the weeks leading up to the Great Exhibition. I have many, many, many more long, long, ridiculous quotes about how much they hated us. Um, the, the idea, though, was, uh, I'm going to go back to that for right now. <laughs> um, the idea, though, really, was that we were not really yet long separated from the mother country, uh, and they had no idea if we were any good at anything. Uh, they assumed us to be bumpkins. We had an enormous space at the Great Exhibition where, um, where America, unlike almost every other nation there, the state, the government of America, had nothing to do with the presentation of the exhibits. Everything there was presented purely on the, on the, you know, the, the money, et cetera, et cetera, presentation skills of the individual engineers and artists and presenters. However, somehow we got an enormous amount of space, an enormous amount of space, and we barely filled it. There was very little actually in there to the point that France just started like taking over a section of our area and presenting a bunch of French stuff in the American section. Um, it was, uh, I, 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 wish that, I wish that there were images of the time. You know, I, I wish that there were phenomenal photographers because there's this great description of this enormous gilded eagle 
that was over our exhibition, looking, glaring at other nations. It's talked about how aggressive and angry it is. Um, but America, man, yeah, okay. So they basically said, you know, you guys don't know what the hell you're doing. Welcome to the party, idiots. <clears throat> and we said, oh, thanks for having us at your party. Let us show you some of the stuff that we brought. So in agriculture, this I think might be a reaping machine and I have no idea what's going on in this um, illustration. Um, <laughs> uh, but the, the first big test of American engineering were the agricultural tests. Um, and so we had a great plow and a couple of interesting reaping machines. So the first test took place at uh, some farmer's estate whose name I can't remember. Um, they came up there with the plows, and people had been, farmers and, and uh, newspaper men had been coming around looking at the American plows in the exhibition and saying, that sure is one tiny plow you got there. Uh, you know, even if it could cut the ground, which we doubt, as soon as it hits a rock, it's gonna shatter. Good luck. So we go up there, everybody's plowing, the British are plowing, we get out there to plow, Mwah. oh, it's phenomenal. One horse tows our plow. There's some guy standing on the back of the plow. The one horse thing I think is actually really important, but again, I don't know how any of this works. Um, but it's a big improvement from what the British were showing. And, our, and we cut these beautiful rough-hewn furrows to which the judges say, ah, your furrows are too rough. They could be much cleaner like our lovely British plows. To which the British farmers say, no, no, if they're too clean, we have to re-break them as we're planting. We will buy all of your plows, nice American man. And they bought up a ton of plows. The British farmers were now using American plows. And there's this slight tone shift in the newspaper saying, huh, looks like those idiots know how to do one thing. Good for them. Um, uh, clear paraphrasing, the, the Victorians were both verbose and incredibly eloquent. Reading Victorian era source records is just inspiring, except that they're saying horrible things about us most of the time. Um, so then the reaping machines, and the reaping machines were this really big turning point. We, the, the, the corn, which I was recently told actually just means the most common grain of a particular place, so I think it was actually wheat. Um, the wheat is green, the, 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 the skies are pouring down rain, it is the worst conditions for reaping during the test. And, and, and the owner of the farm and the judges that are there to judge everything say, well, you know, why don't we hold the reaping off until another day? So there's a bunch of British reapers and, and two American ones. And the Americans say, oh, hell no, we're reaping today, come hell or high water. So the first reaping machine goes out and promptly breaks and doesn't reap anything whatsoever. And so now even the British guys, who were kind of excited to reap, say, ah, all right, we'll do this another day. The remaining American with his reaping machine says, hell no, I came here to reap and I am gonna reap everything. <laughs> <laughs> Probably much more politely. And he does, though. He does. His reaping machine is throwing wheat everywhere. Or like right where it's supposed to go. One or the other. I, don't, I have no idea how this works. But it's reaping like mad. And nobody can believe it. It's the worst conditions. And this thing is amazing. And the British are buying our reaping machines. And we win medals from the jurors. And now there's, there's a significant tone change in the paper saying, you know what? Maybe their art sucks. Maybe they're idiots in the sciences, but they have an entire continent they need to plow and reap. So it would be good of us to pay attention to what they have achieved in agriculture. Very nice of them. But then the yachts. Now the yachts. So, quick preface. People were actually paying attention to this yacht. This is the actual yacht this time. I have a semblance idea of what's going on here. Um, people were paying attention to this as it was being built because they were exploring some new ideas in yacht making and, and the, the British yacht culture were interested to see what the Americans were gonna bring over here. Guy brings his yacht over, aptly called the America, uh, and immediately starts challenging people to races to earn a little money. Um, literally just trying to like bet with other yachtsmen. Um, he has one race, kills the guy, gets, you know, gets a little skrilla, um, and, uh, and nobody will race with him again. So the, there's a big race held now. Uh, I think it was 41 British ships and the America. 
And this is the first year, this is a regular race they did every year, this is the first year that they decided to make an international event. Uh, but again, it was just the British ships and the American. No other nation entered. Um, the Queen came out, the Queen's barge came out. Uh, it was a big, like, celebratory atmosphere. It was a 53-mile race around a couple of islands. Uh, and and there would be people set up having parties at the different islands, and a lot of people in smaller vessels that would try to tack alongside the ships as they, as they sailed out to keep track of the race. Parties everywhere. Great, really excited atmosphere. <clears throat> the America started off with a fouled anchor. So immediately things were going poorly. She was in the back of the pack, finally got going. But by the time they're coming around the first islands, she's already in the middle of the pack. And you know, some of the people there are saying, oh, look at the America, she's doing okay. She's, she's in the middle of the pack, good for her, good for her. Come back around some, you know, another, another batch of islands and boats. And all of a sudden we're in the top like three or four ships. And they're Tacking along, tacking along, going great. Um, three or four ships. People are saying, wow, the American's keeping up with our best boats. This is amazing. This is great. Good for her. She's keeping up. She's keeping up. And then we won by seven miles. <laughs> it was a 53-mile race, and we won it by seven miles. It, uh, it was crazy. Uh, as we're pulling in to cross the finish line, the race is still going on, but we start to cross the Queen's Barge. They lower the colors. Everybody comes out onto the deck of the ship and takes their hats off and bows their head to the queens while the race is still happening. The next day in the newspapers, they said that this was akin to a jockey in a horse race stopping before the finish line to wave at the audience. <laughs> but they loved it. The British loved it. There was a guy with his own private militia, apparently, also near the finish line, who witnessed this, and he just had his militia like firing off shots in celebration. Um, it, was, it was a huge event. And again, we won by seven miles. So when we, when we come in and we cross the finish line, there's this shout that goes out, oh, who won? The America. Who is second? No one. <laughs> Which I'm confident is where we got the idea from uh, <laughs> in, our, <laughs> in our culture. So this race is now called the America's Cup. So if any of you were wondering why it got that name, now you know. Um, there's now a, a very serious change in the tone of the newspapers. Um, and, and they've also been taking note of some other people there. There's some amazing people there. Goodyear was there showcasing his India rubber globes, and who knows what these will become. Um, Morse was there. All sorts of huge things were happening in this one kind of watershed year. But when we won the yacht race, and that significantly, agricultural implements got us a lot of respect from a lot of workmen. Yachts were beloved as both a science and art by an entirely different class of people in England. And all of a sudden the newspapers were saying, okay, America, you guys really brought it. You guys brought some interesting stuff. And they start highlighting some of our other contributions. Some people even going so far as to say that we are contributing more to the well-being of England, more to English industry than any other nation that was there. Because great exhibitions, world fairs, things like that, they're not held to show off what you can do. They're held to draw all of the best things from every other country to you. So, enter A.C. Hobbes. Um, a little background on Hobbes. He was a phenomenal lock picker. He worked for the Dan Newell Company, shilling their paratoptic lock, which I have right here. Uh, so here's the paratoptic lock. I'm not going to go into much in the way of engineering during this talk, because I'm really just trying to tell these people stories. Um, but you can puzzle over that for a little bit, and we can talk about it more in the Lockpick Village later, if you like. Um, but A.C. Hobbs working for Day and Newell. He had established himself as an uh, excellent engineer, but also a phenomenal lock picker. Uh, even in his obituary, they allude more to his lock picking than any other achievement that he, uh, that he carried out in his life. In particular, they highlight, before the Great Exhibition of 1851, his biggest accomplishment in America. Now, he made a name for himself by going around to different banks and saying to the bank director, if I can pick the lock on your vault, you have to buy my lock. And the bank director would say, sure, whatever. And he sold a lot of locks. <laughs> now, it's also important to note, before we... Before I explain how he tested against these locks and what the nature of testing was, I need to talk very briefly about Joseph Brahma. Joseph Brahma was 
born in the 1700s, maybe 1750s, and by 1784, he had patented his safety lock. Now, the safety lock was a really important change in physical security. It was not the first lever-based lock, but it was the first lever-based lock to be mass-produced. It was the first lock in general to have mass production techniques applied to it. And now for the first time, well, for the first time you could buy a lock. Because locks before this were bespoke pieces. They were you know, individually wrought by a locksmith. Locksmiths used to smith locks. They actually made locks. So if you wanted to get a lock made, a decent lock, a lock that might offer you some semblance of protection, and even then not much, you would be shelling out the modern equivalent of like two to 4,000 pounds. Brahma was selling his safety lock for the modern equivalent of about 25 pounds. So now all of a sudden, everybody could have a lock. Locks were being put on everything. Um, you know, your little foot locker at the end of the bed, et cetera, et cetera. Even then, the idea of putting a lock on the door of like a lower or middle class home, that even took a little while before that really happened. It was a lot of portable devices in particular that um, initially got locks applied to them. Additionally, this was the first time in history where a locksmith could make a lock for you, hand it to you, and say, though I made this, I cannot break it. Security by obscurity was the only game in town for the first 3,500 years of lock development. If you made the lock, you knew how to open it. And the person that you made the lock for just had to trust that you weren't going to, nor that you were going to share the secret of that. Few, uh, this, sorry, is his safety lock. This is a vault version of it with many, 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 many tumblers. Um, the at-home version ended up being dramatically less than this. Nobody knew security by obscurity was a, a potentially life-threatening quagmire as much as Louis XVI. So Louis was an avid locksmith himself. He was trained by the master locksmith, Gamain. Um, Gamain made for him the... Uh, the armoire de fer, there we go. Uh, that's Louis's head in there with a skeleton attached to his body. Um, so Gamain made him this beautiful lock where Louis kept a lot of state secrets and personal papers and things that the, uh, you know, not very kind courts of the French Revolution deemed to be treasonous. Now the reason that they were able to get access to that is because as it turns out, Gamain totally went revolutionary when the revolution came. Um, and shared with them the secret of the operation of the lock. Gamain did not open that lock for them himself, he just explained to them how the lock functioned. And knowing that was more than enough. Or, well, exactly enough, it's not more than enough, it's what you need. Um, knowing that is enough to open the lock. So, when Brahma, I'm terrified of this next slide, hopefully I got it right. Bam, yes. Um, this is difficult to read, so I'll read it from the screen. When Brahma made the safety lock, he created the idea that a lock could be impenetrable. That the only thing you needed to obscure was the actual bidding of your key. That by studying your own cylinder, you would not be able to understand how to open somebody else's. This is the birth of that idea. And it's a huge idea. So, in their store in Piccadilly, they had a actually relatively small padlock with, um, I think plated on it, not inscribed on it, this. The artist who can make an instrument that will pick or open this lock shall receive 200 guinea the moment it is produced. Applications in writing only, Brahma's patent locks, caution. The public is respectfully informed that every lock made by Brahma is stamped with their address, 124 Piccadilly. Um, the important part, of course, being the top bit. This was in their Piccadilly storefront from the turn of the 1800s to, to 1851, and even then, a new one was put in the window not long after Hobbes manages to pick this. Spoiler alert. Uh, I'll, I'll tell the story of that. Um, in the 1820s, there was an incredibly serious attack on this lock by a British engineer. That British engineer was given 30 days to work on this lock. If you think about the way in which we test locks now, First of all, they're rarely tested for surreptitious entry anyway. And even then, when we talk about destructive entry or whatever else, we're you know, asking for five minutes resistance, maybe 10 minutes resistance, 15, whatever the case may be. In fact, even in places where they do test for surreptitious entry, such as Japan, the top level of testing, the top level of resistance maxes out at 15 minutes. 
So to get 30 days with a lock is entirely about the idea that a lock can be impenetrable. So the British engineer returns the lock wholly unmolested, completely unopened, completely unable to pick it. Um, so re-enter Hobbes. So in America, too, there was a lot of testing going on with the locks. And while Brahma had one very serious test in the 1820s, in America, we were testing locks like crazy. And we'll talk a little more about that with a quote from the Times of London again um, in a bit. But in particular, Hobbes, the, the highlight of his career in America before he went over to England, was that he went to the Merchants Exchange in New York to test against their vault lock. They had offered $500 to any man who, given 30 days, could open their vault. Hobbes rolled in and did it in an hour. <laughs> he was changing the game. So he goes over to England. Um, let me test the next slide here. Nope. Uh, okay. He goes over to England, and uh, when I thought I was giving this in the lockpick village, it was a lot worse. I'm trying to do better for you people. Um, he goes over there and immediately gets to play with the Chubb lock. Now, Chubb made a phenomenal detector lock um, that is actually a fairly secure lock, very difficult to pick, but he gets his hands on one of the exhibitions. Somebody says, ah, oh, Mr. Hobbs, heard what you can do. Can you pick this Chubb lock? And he picks it for them right there at the exhibition. There's a big to-do, and there's a more formal test against the Chubb lock that'll happen later on. Needless to say, he once again opens it. Um, this one was at the, uh, a man's private vault um, who had a Chubb detector lock installed on it. And once again, Hobbs opens it in an hour. Chubb freaks out, takes out ads in newspapers for the next decade saying, he didn't do it, um, which was great for, for uh, Hobbs because he stayed over there picking Chubb locks and selling his own. In fact... Slight tangent, but it has more to do with lockpicking than yachts do, so you'll enjoy it. Um, he, uh, he got a call from somebody who said, you know, uh, we lost our key to this Chubb lock. It was a bank. Um, we desperately need to get inside of the vault. We, took, we went over to Chubb, and they said they could not make a new key for us or possibly get into the vault. Can you help us? <laughs> So he sent out uh, one of his boys to go and make measurements of the, of the vault, came back, gave him all of the measurements. He shows up with his tools, opens it in under an hour, takes on, and sells them you know, a Hobbs lock, uh, which is now what he's calling the paratoptic lock that Dan Newell made. He, he moved to England and just started selling the paratoptic lock, calling it the Hobbs lock, and made his fortune over the next 15 years. Um, the Dan Newell company, however, folded over here in America. So... But the real test was against the Brahma, and Brahma also handles this a lot better. Um, where Chubb flips out, taking out ads in newspapers, showing up to mechanics institutes and saying that it never happened and trying to get another test going, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, Brahma, upon being defeated, paid up that 200 guinea. So, Hobbes goes over and says, I would like to test on the Brahma lock, the Piccadilly one. He has the uh, absolute ideal conditions for working there, absolutely ideal. They mount it in a wooden block for him so that it's unmovable. Um, he has access to his tools. Again, he gets 30 days to test against this lock. Of those 30 days, he worked about 14 of them. Of those 14 days, he had about 51 hours um, actually working with the lock. After 51 hours, and especially when we look at the other things that he had managed to accomplish before this. It took him 51 hours to finally defeat this lock. But he did. And once defeated, he had been able to design a tool that would allow him to rapidly reproduce the attack. So the jurors noticed that it was open. He locked it for them. A couple of days later, they reconvened, and he picked it right in front of them and closed it again. So the 51 hours was basically research time to build a tool. The Hobbes pick is actually nowadays more often referred to as the two-in-one pick and is still what people use to pick lever locks today. Not much has changed in the last 150 years. Brahma, to their credit, not only pay up, but additionally, update a lock and put a new one in that Piccadilly window within the month with the same inscription on it. They, are, they handled it fa famously. So... This moment was a phenomenal change in both the British and American senses of self-esteem, though it was kind of a, a, a 
you know, like that. Um, in particular, from a newspaper in America, I can't remember what one, America still adds to her laurels in England, in addition to making the fastest yachts, the best plows, the most serviceable reaping machines, etc., etc. She can now boast of outdoing the world in picking locks. The distinction is of somewhat questionable character. Generally, the persons who have been most expert at this business have not enjoyed the highest degree of respect and confidence of society at large. <laughs> Nationally, however, the prejudice does not seem to obtain. England seems to think just as much of us and even a little more, although we have beaten her in everything and picked her locks besides. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, oh, that, that sentence for me. Like, if I ever write a book, it'll probably be in Pictor Locks Besides. <laughs> in England, um, this was actually only about a week after the yacht race finished that word of what Hobbes had done started reaching the press. So we were already finally fairly well respected. Nope. That one. This is a long one. I'm going to interrupt it. Try not to read too far ahead. We believed before the exhibition opened that we had the best locks in the world, and among us, Brahma and Chubb were reckoned quite as impregnable as Gibraltar. More so indeed, for the key of the Mediterranean was taken by us. But none among us could penetrate into the locks and shoot the bolts of these makers. In this faith, we had quietly established ourselves for years. And it seems cruel at this time of day when men have been taught to look at their bunches of keys and at their drawers and safes with something like confidence to scatter that feeling to the winds. Yikes. This next section, though, illustrates what was great about what was happening in America at the time and what would go on to be adopted by the British for the next generation or so. The mechanical spirit, however, is never at rest. And if it is lulled into a false state of listlessness in one branch of industry and in one part of the world, elsewhere it springs up suddenly to admonish and reproach us with our supineness. Our descendants on the other side of the water are, every now and then, administering to the mother country a wholesome filial lesson upon this very text. And recently they have been rubbing us up with a severity which we perhaps merited for sneering at their shortcomings in the exhibition. While we have been relying implicitly upon the artful arrangement of tumblers and such like devices, they have been carefully developing their ingenuity in picking and opening locks. A man makes a lock and he brings it to a mechanics institute in New York with a certain sum of money secured by it, which sum becomes the property of the successful operator who can shoot back the bolt of the new contrivance. Instantly, astute heads and clever expert hands are engaged in solving the mechanical riddle thus propounded to them. And so far have these dexterous manipulators carried their art that their open sesame sweeps springs, tumblers, false notches, letter devices, and everything else before it. You have to have both sides when you're engineering security. You have to have both sides. And this is exactly what was being said in 1851. This was the moment that security by obscurity should have died. It did die, again, for about a generation. The slide I should have been showing right there. So, to riff on that, it should have died. It should have died forever. But during that generation, in England in particular, there was a ton of study. There were people, uh, the Royal Society would hold month after month these amazing convocation of lock engineers and people who were in other engineering fields altogether, all of these ludicrous polymaths. The guy that cast the bell for Big Ben, of which he didn't know anything about bell making, but made his own alloy of metal to cast for Big Ben, which cracked like three times. So he probably wasn't the guy that should have been doing it. But still, uh, like he got very involved in lock engineering and this big debate debate about which lock was better, and, and people were now, just like the American tradition, bringing locks that they had designed and testing against them, putting money up if people could open them. Uh, the people picking against them would put money up in case they destroyed the lock in the course of attacking it. But if that happened, they got to keep the destroyed lock to study it and to learn from it and to think about how to attack it. Even the paratoptic lock, the one that would go 
completely unopened at, in England in 1851. The newspaper is a quote that I didn't bother putting in because it's even longer than the long ones I've read already. Said, you know what? Our bakers better go back and start making better locks or they better march over to the opposite end of that exhibition hall and open those American locks. They tried and they couldn't. Paratoptic lock held against all of them. No one was able to open it. And the paratoptic lock would not have, have held, except that there was a guy by the last name of uh, Pettis, an engineer by the last name of Pettis, and these damn Victorians hate using first names, which is infuriating when you're trying to track people down later, but Mr. Pettis, an unknown engineer, wrote a letter to the Day and Newell Company saying, hey, I know you just made a bunch of improvements to your lock, and I've just been playing around with a new one, and I can pick it. And here's how I pick it, and here's some ideas for how you might improve that. It was you know, one of these beautiful early examples of responsible disclosure. And they did improve it, and that became the paratoptic lock. And that is what went to England. And had Pettis not piped up and said, hey, I've been playing with your lock, and I picked it, and sent them a letter, and had they not taken him seriously and implemented those changes and thanked him for his help, if my tone is not clear, this is not the situation that we enjoy with lock manufacturers today then our locks may have been opened. Then this may not have been the watershed moment in physical security that it became. So, right now I'm working on a theory. And I'm, you know, poking holes in it and testing it and seeing where it stands up and where it doesn't. But my theory is that the public were only able to tolerate the public exploration of physical security for about 20 years. As that newspaper makes clear, as they said, it seems cruel at this time of day to scatter that security to the winds. For 70 years, for three generations, and for the first time in the history of locks, everyday people were buying locks and were believing that they were impenetrable. They had secured their entire lives by locks. So when you then say to them, ooh, our bad, turns out that entire idea is faulty. Turns out we're going to keep exploring it publicly, publishing in newspapers and, and agricultural magazines and, and anybody that will print the details on how we're attacking, exploiting, and developing new locks. We're going to talk about all of it publicly. And you're going to remain terrified because you're still trying to secure your lives. There was a backlash. Um, there is a far, uh, probably too often quoted um, line uh, uh, of Hobbes talking about how, you know, well, of course we're going to continue studying publicly because the thieves and rogues will always have this information before us. This debate was going on even as soon as he opened that lock, even as soon as he began picking and publishing, and in America as well. But the tide turned. The tide turned with the public willingness to tolerate the exploration of locks. Newspapers stopped knowing anything about locks anymore. There's this crazy transition. 1851 through like 1870, newspapers were writing occasionally not wholly accurate but really interesting and insightful details about locks that were being developed, about uh, uh, attacks that were being carried out on them. But by 1900, you're now seeing entries talking about, ah, oh, you must have gotten out of that with a skeleton key while warded locks and skeleton keys continued to exist at that point, those weren't the attacks that were valid anymore, not against genuinely secure spaces. This was in reference to a deaf-mute 13-year-old who escaped from his federal jail cell, um, which is an entire the whole other talk and heartbreaking. He went to jail for the first time at, at 11, at age 11, into a federal prison. Um, and his, he had a deaf-mute little brother, too. Anyway, that's it's a beautiful story, but not what we're talking about today. Um, so... Additionally, we have the rise of the locksmith as a technician instead of the locksmith as a smith, as somebody creating uh, uh, metal and brass and, and, and so on. And secret knowledge is cash. Secret knowledge translates into a livelihood. So, with that knowledge already beginning to become taboo, circling the wagons, getting laws passed, creating guild structures, disallowing the public from exploring the security devices of their own homes, becomes business in the guise of securing the public. Because this happened, 
The American residential security market, as a very clear example, did not change for 150 years. And I don't mean that we had incremental changes here or there, and things are very similar to how they were back then. I mean that there was literally no change to the locks that people bought and put on their middle class homes for 150 years. Because to explore them and to develop them and to improve them was taboo. And this brings me to my last thought. And I think I'll have a little bit to take questions, maybe. Excellent. Taboo. The three things that actually draw the line between private and public space are the threat of violence. The threat of violence then leads to taboo, because you teach other people that you might get killed if you go into there. And taboo always becomes law. And those three things, the threat of violence, taboo, and the law, are the real dividing line between private and public property from time immemorial. The lock, particularly in the context of the American residential security market, is simply a symbol of those three things. If you think to yourself how you feel coming upon an open door, coming upon a door that is closed but has no lock on it, coming upon a door that has a lock but is unlocked, and coming upon a door that is locked. There is this fantastic spectrum of emotional response to those situations that most people never actually take a moment to think about. An open door with no lock on it is a public space. Enjoy yourself, walk around. Maybe if it's a space you don't know, you walk through and you're looking for somebody to make sure everything's cool. A closed door with no lock on it, you have to physically interact with, you're walking through, and now you're very seriously looking for another human being, but you're probably going to continue to explore that space. Even with the lock being unlocked, the moment you see a lock on a door and make the decision to test that door anyway, there is something in you that knows that you are crossing over into what is potentially a private space. And the decision to break a lock, to open a lock that is locked to enter a private space is visceral. And we have a lot of people when they open their first lock that have very interesting reactions to it. Some are thrilled, but some are on the opposite side of the spectrum where discovering that it's so easy to do, particularly for most of the locks in the American residential security market, that they nearly shut down in their idea of continuing that exploration of security. And you see this modern equivalent to what was happening in 1870, where people finally just said, just stop talking about it. We just want our locks. We just want to continue living in our secure world. Please stop talking about it. And you can see that reaction even with people today. So the big change, 150 years, in 2007, the residential security market actually changed for the better. Uh, there are a lot of problems with the lock, but a guy named Walt Strader looked at the pin tumbler lock that his company was producing that was horrible, that was the laughing stock of the industry, and said, hey, we ought to make another lock. Which rarely happens in the security market. Medico have never changed the basic concept of their lock. They've added things, they've changed things here or there, but the basic idea has remained the same forever. Multi-lock iterate faster than almost anybody in the industry, but even then, their primary locking concept has remained the same since they made their first lock. Walt making the decision to make a new lock was huge, and thank goodness somebody did it. There's still problems with the lock, I won't go into that, but those are the ideas. We had this amazing moment in time where we were not only allowed, but encouraged and celebrated to explore the security of the world around us in a public and open way, and it slipped right through our fingers. I think we're at a turning point now where we have that chance again, and I want us to pay good attention to the past so that we don't lose it in a generation. Thank you. Any questions? Yes, sir. Uh, I've, I've done a little bit of uh, research on, on locks for, uh, for a friend, and we're curious as, as to the best lock. Is the Medico, or is that the best? Uh, not really. So it depends on your security situation. Um, you have to keep in mind the idea of total security. So the cylinder on your door 
on the, there's an attack in uh, uh, Russia and the really creepy video of a woman teaching a bunch of school children to do this, um, where their doors are such thin sheet metal that you can literally take a can opener and just cut the lock away. Um, so uh, honestly, in general, especially if it's a residential situation, I would very seriously think about the level of security you want in that cylinder compared to the level of security that you know, consumes the rest of your home. Um, Medico do make a fine product. They've had some problems. Uh, you know, the, the far end of this answer is Abloy Protec with a drum Gemini shield over it. Uh, and you can ask us more about that later on. But that would be a badass solution for your home. Um, Sorry to no, go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, definitely come over, particularly to the to the high and mid security section, and chat to some of the folks who have stuff there, because there's some gorgeous locks from all over the world there. Yes, sir. Have you ever heard the story that Brahma was actually happy that Hobbs picked his lock because for many many years nobody bought a new lock, and as soon as he did, they came out with the newest lock, and they were selling it to replace their old lock. I love that idea. I would love to, if you have any reference to that whatsoever. Oh, actually, let me put this out there. Uh, again, you can find me in various places. Um, I am trying to gather researchers to me to help me mine some of this stuff. If anybody is interested in that, please drop me a line. I've had some amazing people dig up some wonderful things so far. Um, I'm putting as much time into this as I can right now, but it's going to be a little while before I can devote myself full time to it. Um, that's phenomenal. I honestly wouldn't even doubt that. Um, Bra so Brahma, unfortunately, was dead by the time this happened, but his sons, the additional Brahmas, genuinely handled this with such grace and, and, and passion for making a new lock. Oh my god, and I have a lot more. I have this huge man crush on Linus Yale Jr. right now. Um, I can talk your ear off about some of the amazing things about him, but anyway. Uh, any other questions? Thank you all so much. Come hang out with us in Lockping Village. Hope this was interesting. Thank you. Uh, I just wanted to say thanks a lot to Skyler because he wasn't actually supposed to do this talk here, but he filled in for us the last minute, so a big hand to him. Um, like he said, we have the lockpicking village. Uh, we also have, if you guys want to make your, your blue badges, you can buy parts and sit at the hardware hacking village. We also have the tamper contest going on. You can make a synthesizer, right? You can make a, a little uh, MIDI synth. and That's then. Awesome. Charlie has like a little plug-in thing, so you could have an actual speaker on it. We didn't put speak. We didn't put speakers. Sorry, I'm drunk, but uh, <laughs> we didn't put speakers because it drains the batteries really fast. But uh, you could always hack it per se <laughs> and uh, do it yourself. So enjoy lunch. Uh, I think it's lunch. Is it lunch? Oh yeah, this is lunch now. So enjoy lunch yeah. and then come back to the next talk. Uh, again, we have lots of stuff in the other room as well. And thank you for coming. Thanks to Skylar again. Thanks, buddy. Thanks, we appreciate it. I had to run out. Yeah, I got that. I know the gist of it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the stuff, like I said, that I'm super.